And can I ask my question? Yes, you can ask your question. I'm coming right back to this and then I'll share the screen. Yeah. Um, so our um, client with the neuromuscular issue, uh, disease, yeah. I guess I should say, not issue, bigger than that. Um, you know, he's super, super tight. And he, we, we always stretch his uh, psoas, Thomas stretch or hips on the roller type of stretch. And he's also going to a PT, a different PT okay. for the, the ALS. Um, and that PT has him press his thigh into the, gu the guy's hand first and then push down to stretch. And I, I know that's something PTs tend to do, that kind of thing. And I wondered what that was all about. Yeah. So that's a, con we call it contract, relax. Um, and you can actually use it to stretch any muscle. Sometimes, mm -hmm. especially if a muscle is a little spastic. So in his case, mm -hmm. because, because of the ALS, his muscles have a tendency to maybe get a little spastic. So you can ask, basically you ask the muscle to contract and then when they release it, they usually can relax a little bit further than if you just try and if you push down on something, for example, mm -hmm. it sometimes has this reactive grip mm -hmm. and, and so it grips in protection. But if you have them contract first and then relax as they relax, you, we call it taking up the slack. You okay. take up the slack on the stretch on the muscle stretch. So you actually get a little bit more in that relaxed phase. So okay. you you could do that if you felt like he's fighting back against the stretch. Just say, oh, push up in my hand for a second. And then uh, and then say, okay, now relax. And just, you're not going to like heat, but you right, just right. keep your weight on it as he relaxes. And that might help him uh, release it a little bit more. He thinks it, do it did. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and probably yeah. because he gets a little spastic. He does. He gets totally, it, not, not, not so much in the quads, always in the hamstrings, but. Yeah. yeah, you could do the same for hamstrings. He could do it to himself, really. Right. Okay. Essentially, like he could have him um, press down in, into. You could push away with the strap, foot in the strap. Have him push away into the strap, and then relax again. And then you can take up the slack, or he can take up the slack, even if he's doing it himself. Okay. So you could teach him to even do that for himself, or maybe even put the strap behind his thigh or something. You could put the strap behind his thigh, or you could put his foot in the spring. Um, yeah, yeah. Or the or the thigh in the spring, or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was yeah. I knew it'd be a pretty easy question for you to answer. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're trying to make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a client of ours, and um, this is her kind of the little note, little note on her. So she's having pain in her neck on the right side. Nothing seems to be helping her. She did one Pilates session and it went well, but she felt really slow to her. She's a tennis player and had an injury in May where she bent her finger back on the right hand. A month, and she actually was braced for that, I should say. So the hand was not functioning for a little while. A month later, she woke up in serious neck pain in her right cervical region. That was early June. She's done massage and chiropractic care and physical therapy with Kaiser, but nothing is helping her. And I put in the with Kaiser to remind me to explain what that actually is like. So physical therapy at Kaiser is really, you see a physical therapist once every two weeks, maybe for four visits is what you get at the most. And really it's about them telling you what to do for movement and maybe feeling around a little bit and giving you some stretches. And then they don't even really go over the exercises with you. Um, and so they tell you, go home and do these kind of things. So she just didn't feel like that was sufficient for her. And, uh, and then she's, uh, she thinks that she, it might be an issue with her rotator cuff on the right uh, as well, maybe not just her neck. And she has a history of elbow tendonitis on the right side. So she had like a tennis elbow on the right side that would come and go even before the finger injury. She was going to check in with her doctor because she wasn't doing better, but she decided to come in and see us. She had an x-ray with no like Real result, the, the x-ray didn't really show that much, only some mild degenerative disc disease. She is about, I would say, late 40s, early 50s in age. So she shouldn't really be having a lot of stenosis or um, mild DVD, DDD is kind of normal degenerative disc at this age. 
So that's basically what we have on her or had on her initially. So what questions, what questions would you have want or what would you want more information on? I guess if range of motion, if there's certain positions that would aggravate more or not. Okay. So range of motion is a good question because if we have to, so in her case, when she came in and, and um, it'd be nice to do a follow-up with her and see what her doctor said too. But if somebody comes in and they have cervical and shoulder pain, both, it can be super hard to differentiate. Is it neck or is it shoulder? So if it's, if it's cervical really, then range of motion at the shoulder should not be an issue at all. If it's shoulder, then range of motion at the shoulder may be an issue. Um, and if it's neck, range of motion at the neck might be an issue. So actually a great way to sort of start teasing out whether it's actually neck or whether it's shoulder and if it, which one is referring where, if so, is to look at range of motion in both. So um, if you can, in her case, look at, does she have, neck motion is, is her neck moving rotation flexion extension side bending is she moving pretty equally on both sides or is there some limitation there um if there's no limitation and no pain then you i start to think okay maybe we really need to look at the shoulder itself so then you could check on the shoulder does it what is she, what does her range of motion look like i usually look at flexion extension, I look at um, abduction range just to see what that mechanic looks like. And the other ones I look at are internal rotation and external rotation. And for those, I usually have them lay down. And you could see, like if you were gonna do your pec stretch on the roller, that's external rotation. Internal rotation would just be resting the elbows and letting the arms kind of fall down that way. And so uh, you could tell if one was different than the other and she would also have pain if there was something going on with one of those. And so um, I would first probably check those things and see what I think it might be. And if you can reproduce her pain while you're having her move that way, then you have a pretty good idea. Okay, I think it has something to do with the shoulder because it hurt. We reproduced her pain when we moved her shoulder or we it has something to do with the neck because we reproduced the pain when she moves her neck, right? If, so if that's clear, um, the only times we don't want to move the shoulder in extreme range of motion is when we think there's a tear. So if you think it's a shoulder issue and the shoulder, they didn't study the shoulder, mm. right? They only give us an x-ray or she only has an x-ray result for the neck. So then if you go in and you start moving her shoulder and she has pain at one of those motions, especially with internal rotation or external rotation, because that would speak to rotator cuff. Um, then I would probably not want to push range of motion because I wouldn't want to tear a partially torn tear more, if that makes sense. So I would wait and have her check in about her shoulder if it, the shoulder's painful before I push range of motion. You can have her move in a comfortable range of motion though. You can work through a comfortable range. So just tell her to, you know, when it gets uncomfortable, you need to stop. Um, and so if that's the case, you just have her shorten the range of motion or work in a shortened range. You can work for strengthening though in a comfortable range also. So you could really do some strength work with her. Um, and then same thing, the neck is a little bit less. So with the neck, I would work on range of motion. I would work on little isometrics, like small things that would increase range of motion, little isometrics with the finger, right? For rotation, for side bend, for flexion, for extension. All those things usually feel really good, those really light ones. Uh, and they won't cause any damage. And you can do the big, big stretches, like the strap stretch. All of those things can really loosen up for the neck. You're not as worried that there is some small structure that might contain. Does that help? Yeah. Um, 
I was just working with her. <clears throat> and so uh, when you talk about the internal and external rotation, um, I think it was the week before last, I had her do some text lab just to see what happened. And it was slow, and then it was this back motion that yeah. got her. Would that be extra? That, that, That's extra motion. Yeah. Okay. And then versus like today we did a TW arms. We did W and W felt okay. Right. Okay. So that's a great point. And, and you were prone. She was prone. prone. Okay. So that's a great point. If somebody, and actually I think Kim, you might've encountered this with that client back that that's no longer coming, the difficult one with the, sh you were working on her. You were doing a, a, a lap pull. So uh, this position, this, uh, this is a very vulnerable position if somebody has a rotator cuff issue going on. So this, especially if you turn palm away, that's gonna be more so for our lap pulls down here, mm -hmm. because most, they'll do something wrong and not be here, whereas, which is what we want them to be, to be protected, they'll be here um, or not supported. If there's a tear in the rotator cuff, this is often quite painful. Uh, so anything pec lat behind the head um, where it's a stretch is gonna be painful and, and maybe put them at risk for hurting more or a little tearing more, it's really intense. So all of the ones that we do like chicken wings, pec lat, that's all, going to be really hard for them unless it's in the range where it stays in front of their body even sometimes pec stretch on the roller is too much uh, if there's a rotator cuff issue um, so but when you do it actively so Genevieve was asking why is it when when I put her in prone and we do the w that that works because it's an active activation of the back muscles right not you're not pulling the arms behind it's pulling the scapula together and it's coming back. It's more supported. It's a very muscularly supported and there's no force pulling it in that direction. Whereas all the others have a bar or something that's fixing them in a place where they can go really wrong. So if somebody has a rotator cuff issue, even the double lap pulls that we do that I love so much on the end, I have to be really careful about hand placement it needs to be forward mm -hmm. and not back here. Functionally, that relates to like reaching in the back seat of the car, yeah. um, reaching to shut a door behind, putting it on a bra is the internal rotation, right? So buckling a bra on the back is internal rotation. That can also be painful. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the prone, the prone stuff on the ball is fantastic for the neck mm -hmm. and, and stability through the thoracic spine and neck and really usually really safe. Yeah. yeah. I um I noticed and it's I imagine possibly because of that shoulder issue the you know we see the, the lack of mobility in the shoulder blade and the uh, scapula retraction. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working a bit on that. That's one of the exercises from PT at Kaiser gave her was um, yeah, sorry, this, uh, but it was standing okay, and she's yeah. unable to right to do it um, so I gave it to her you know on the roller instead and it was much more accessible but there definitely is like a we then did it on a, with the bar um, on the Cadillac and I had her actively just let the Lower. bar kind of push shoulder blade together and that was she was able to really connect with that mm -hmm. so that was good that was great so serratus uh, two things on that Serratus is a fantastic exercise for stabilizing the shoulder girdle. So anybody with a shoulder issue, really, I always do serratus press. It's usually, usually not painful unless you overload it and they can't control, but um, really great. And what you want to do, actually, yesterday I was working with somebody and I thought, oh, I need to talk to the girls about that because... I actually had to put my hands on her shoulder blade and move it for her while I had her on the Cadillac doing serratus press, but she couldn't get out of this, you know, that way they go up in their neck. She couldn't get the wrap this way. So I had to physically go and put her shoulder blade there 
and back. So I had my hands just guiding the motion that she was supposed to do so she could get it in her head. But that is one of the primary stabilizing muscles for the shoulder girdle. So if there's something wrong with the shoulder, you can definitely use that. And then on a cavity, like the opposite of that is that that also gets really stiff uh, with injury. And we need to be especially careful about that happening in women who are mid forties to 60, because that is where frozen shoulder happens a lot. And one of the first signs of that shoulder freezing is that scapular immobility. So something that I work on a lot with people who have frozen shoulder is mobilizing the scapula. So it's a great thing to do for those both reasons. One, to strengthen it, but also to keep that mobility. So we don't know why people get frozen shoulder really. So keeping them from getting there would be, yeah. would be great. Yeah. So excellent choice. Um, I just have a, a quick question about when you're talking about the single lat pull. Um, and so are we saying that she's, she could do, she could do the single lat pull with the, I can't see, but like the regular hand position. Underhand or overhand? Overhand. The over, overhand. Yeah. She could do that one. So if you suspect that she has a rotator cuff tear, that might not be your best choice. It'll nah, okay. be easier this way because it'll keep this here a little bit more. And if you angle the elbow in a little bit, so that's where I would start is, is and maybe even you started on the bar, the wooden bar with the, um, not the push through bar because then she, she will move it where she's comfortable, right? If it's a fixed bar and they put their arm there and they think they have to keep it there and it's, they go to pull and it hurts. They have no movement there, but they do if you're on the springs because the, if, it, if it doesn't feel right, they'll actually pull it incorrectly and you can kind of find where they can go uh, without discomfort and help them there. So th there's on a fixed bar, if there's a rotator cuff injury, you need to just be really careful. So I would start underhand and forward. So maybe double lap pulls forward with the hands forward and then just work them back to a comfortable, they have to stay comfortable range. Okay. And then that's great work because we want to get those lats on. We want to get their lower trapezius firing, right? We want to get those mechanics right because that's going to help alignment of the shoulder overall. So how, how in that, because I know that sometimes, and maybe it's just the, hand, the, the first hand position where your knuckles are facing you, like, just making sure it doesn't go into the pack. Like it oh, really goes, it does not go into the lat. Pack. Yeah, like you're really using your lot. Like you're not, cause it's not like, I feel like sometimes when the arm's up forward more, like if they can't be that open, like more forward, it just, it kind of gets like they're pulling with the pack. It's hard to just, yeah, it's, I feel like it's hard sometimes that they're so tight just to get. Yeah. Back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there may definitely be some pack action. You would see it this direction uh, when mm. you pull rather than this. If you can keep them, even if you have to come in front and the pet goes on, if you keep them pulling to their side here, right? That's yeah. still still gonna get this work here, even if peck's a little on. If it's if it turns out to be all peck, you'll see this. Oh, right, right, yeah, because it'll, it'll so tight here. Okay, yeah, that, that makes and, sense. And I'm that exaggerating so you could see it, but- No, I'm glad would... you're exaggerating, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, you're not exaggerating. <laughs> I know some people are some people are like that. But you would re that's how you would recognize it if it was all peck and nothing happening here. Elbow tilts back, shoulder really rolls forward. But if you keep their elbow here, it's gonna be a lot harder. Right. They then the, and remember, you can really change what's happening at the shoulder by where the elbow is. So a lot of times if they're back here, that's where they're I, I, for me, I feel like they expose the front of their shoulder and I'm going to worry if I see exposed shoulders. I want to see uh, closed and lock set into position shoulders here, but that's a nice, right? You recognize that you don't want that. So if this is what's happening, you can just steer the elbow and look what happens, right? So from there, you just steer the elbow and my shoulder just goes down. So you can do that and have them drop that elbow forward okay. and just start there and then you can slowly make it bigger when you know that they're doing it well 
but I would keep palm at you rather than palm away if there's any, because this is going to open this and make it more exposed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that totally makes sense when I think about hand position, the motion and the rotator cuff and yes. So got it. Thanks. Yeah. Why did she think that Pilates was too slow? The first session, because she's one of those, she's kind of like me, you know, she's athletic. She has a, yeah. likes to play tennis. She wants to sweat. She wants to work hard. She had that impression. And so I wanted to see, I wanted to make sure, like I wrote that down just so that we could make sure that she felt pushed enough. But she came to, um, I saw her for a session and she came to another session and she realized, and I did explain to her that it's supposed to be slow because we need to reorganize your movement before we can make you move faster. But we could, but just so that we also are aware that she needs to feel like she's working kind of thing. So it doesn't all have to be for a whole hour of reorganizing. It could be some work happening that's going to be helpful or like pushing her abs a lot. It's going to help that whole posture, but letting her work hard for the abs because we're not worried about her back or anything like that. So let her just really work hard in some part of the workout. And then, and then it's easier to reprogram in the rest of the workout, you know, the rest of the time. Um, uh, if, if we suspect a rotator cuff tear or some, some tear in the shoulder, should we say, I think you might have a tear in your shoulder. You should get, get it checked out. You should say, you should never say what you think it is. This is a problem. Yeah. I mean, even I'm not really supposed to say, but you could say, I'm concerned that there's something else going on at your shoulder and it's probably worth the, I would feel more comfortable if somebody else looked at it and maybe they could decide if you need an MRI or so that that's sort of my language around it too, is I'm concerned that there could be something else going on at your shoulder and not at your neck. And actually this particular patient, I did talk to her about that, about how if the shoulder doesn't get better, usually what I do is I say, let's give it six weeks because that's how long it takes for tissues to heal is just six weeks, right? And you know that you can safely strengthen in a non painful way. So if she's not in find exercise, like internal external shoulder, internal external rotation, everybody should be doing that. And likely biceps curling, if you're suspecting something at the shoulder itself. So, um, those are always good. You just shorten the range of motion. So they're pain-free and have them work on those. Tell them be consistent for six weeks. If the, if they're getting better and there's not pain or the pain's getting less and less great. You just keep on course. If they're not getting better, or they get worse in the process, then you want to say, you know, this is, I just want to make sure maybe it's nothing, but maybe there's something there that we want to know about. So I would feel more comfortable if you would check in with your doctor on that and let's just see what they say. Usually people will be really grateful for that. Yeah. But I think you can, as long as you can keep them pain-free and the pain is getting better, I think you can work with them for six weeks without knowing for sure unless it just seems more and more sensitive. And then in daily life, right? Functionally, those are the things you wanna also maybe talk to them about. You tell them that this, this position is not gonna be very secure for you. So can you think of like, don't reach in your back seat to grab your purse or uh, try not to pick things up behind you or try and turn to close the door, not like close the door as you walk by behind you. You know, those sort of things um, to just give them some idea of how not to aggravate it in there regular life too yeah she said that uh, she went to the one of the sessions with you last week yes yeah and she said that was really helpful oh good uh, and she yeah she was she said that she a lot of things clicked for her um, and she said particularly the rowing helped alleviate the neck pain that's right there yeah, she's there yeah. so yeah she was like oh, that's so <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I am actually writing up all the exercises that I did in the classes. Um, I'm just taking, I was going to do, cause I did two of each body area. I was going to just combine it and just write up one write up for both. So I'll, I'll send them to everybody too. So you guys can see what exercise I was doing in those classes. Um, and I'm writing down, not just the name of the exercise, but also like emphasis was this or emphasis was that. 
pay attention to this or that. So I have them all partially done and then completely finished, but I, I'll get there. <laughs> Bye, Kim. <laughs> Do you guys have, um, how does that sound, Allegra, okay? Yeah, I just had a, I wasn't sure if Kim was saying bye or she had a question, but I, I did have a question. I was going to let her go. Um, I, yeah, that sounds good. And um, so with a client of that, I guess, uh, personality type, would it be important before when the session begins, just, just sort of lay out the session and say, well, it might seem kind of slow because we're doing a postural assessment and we're just seeing what it takes to get organized here to just so they can kind of, um, I guess, uh, not get anxious about that they're not yeah. ready for yeah. something. Yeah, so um, I think that's absolutely fine. I, I, when I do a physical therapy eval, I tell people that this session, I'm gonna do a lot of assessing and a lot of writing because I need to do, I wanna make sure I have everything down so that I can really think about it and make sure that I've got, you know, all my all my ducks in a row, so I know what how to best treat you. So you could say something similar, and and then I say, and I'm going to show you. I want to make sure that you leave with some exercises you can do at home. But next mm -hmm. time you come in, we can go at a faster pace. We won't be I won't be sitting here writing and asking you a whole bunch of questions. We'll um, just get moving right away, and we'll get to use a lot of the equipment. So a lot of times I'll preface the session with that, like say. You know, this is how it's going to go today. Um, just so you know, that it's not a typical session uh, and that we do want to slow down to reprogram or to get things aligned right and to learn about posture. But then as soon as we've got the pattern, the correct patterns down, then we get to ramp up really quickly. So sometimes, you know, I'll use that sort of language just to let them know. And then they don't think, oh my gosh, this Pilates thing is going to be so slow every time. This is going to be so boring. You know, they don't they think, okay, well, that was a slow session, but it's going to get faster. But mm -hmm. I did want to mention, I had another client come up to me today, actually. I ran into her, and she said um, that she misses, I used, you guys remember, I used to teach that 7 a.m. Friday morning class, and it was the same group every week, and I just plowed them through. Like, the first half hour, it was actually the whole time, was, like, one thing after the other, pretty much nonstop. I would make corrections. I'd make them hold it sometimes, but they were really tired by the end of the session. And she said, I really miss that. And I'm not getting that level of intensity in my privates. And I wish I would just get worked harder. So I think, you know, we sometimes tend to be so careful that we don't work the people out hard. So I think hard can still be careful and safe. And I think it's okay to push people because that's how they're going to get stronger. So I think, and I think maybe hanging out with me too much is not helping you make harder, faster paced sessions because I keep telling you, oh, look at that. Look for this, look for that, you know? So I'm kind of forcing you into a slowdown, but the intention is that the sessions do get paced up and that you can move through. So maybe it would be a great exercise just to take a look at all your clients and say, what can I do? Or maybe make part of every session a, what can I do safely to make this person's heart rate go up a bit and to make them feel like they're working hard and still keep them safe. And then I can spend the rest, what can I do that rest of the session that's gonna give them the most value for sort of that reprogramming idea. So I think that kind of a session actually over the long haul is more attractive for people than a session that's always at the same pace or the whole session at the same pace. So maybe just take a little challenge. It wasn't a client that you had seen, Allegra. It's actually one that Kim and Minjay are seeing. And um, so, and she's the one who had mentioned that, but I think that just made me go, oh yeah, I've been spending so much time teaching you guys how to slow down and correct that sometimes that interferes with the actual getting them going and flowing. So, <laughs> right you're smiling so I think you're, you're well, and then of course if we were going too fast I'd be like I just you know which is, you know it'd be the opposite but you know there's just trying to find that right thing but that's a good thing just mixing it up you know kind of getting yeah. getting that getting so, changing it up yeah if we come back to our this client that we've been talking about with the shoulder and neck uh, maybe the exercises that we go pretty quickly through are ab work we make her work really hard for those abs we do the five just like one after the other after the other 
for 20 minutes. And then we start slowing her down to get focused on the head and neck posture. You know, I like that so, formula. Yeah. Right. So she gets going, she gets her heart rate up, she gets working. And then when she's worked some, then you, then she's going to be more like, okay, that felt really good. Like I could really feel that. And then, and then you start putting the pieces together and breaking down what she's to do for that upper quadrant. You know, you could also use footwork and bottom lift and even jump board at times to do that for people to make them work hard safely. If it's an upper body thing. Um, and then peel it back and work on all those little fine tuning. But if they come in and it's always the same slow pace and it's always slow and it's always fix this and fix that. And she only gets to do three exercises because that's all there's time for by the time, like even my voice gets boring that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I put everyone to sleep. So, I mean, it's just a good, another good challenge, right? Just making, and I need to think about that too. Uh, also at times like what can I do I have a male client who actually I saw this morning too and there's no way that he would work with me if I slowed him down uh, that slow all the time so what I do is we get on there we do footwork on three three reds and a yellow today we did footwork we did single leg footwork we did bottom lift uh, we did lap pulls and then I was like okay now get up let's go to the Cadillac you know we went to the Cadillac we slowed down but then he was ready to slow down. And then when he looked like he wasn't ready to slow down, I laid him down and we did more abs on the mat. Like, so that I just keep in, interrupting the pace and I keep him interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and I pick strategically, it's strategically, and I'll sit there and I'm sure you guys are planning this too, but when somebody's doing one exercise, I'm sitting there going, what can I do next? What's the best thing I could do next? Is she going to tolerate that? Or is he going to tolerate that? Or okay, wait, I'll squeeze this in here and get them going. And then we'll come back and do that. You know, I, I'm always rolling around in my head. What's the best thing next based on what I'm seeing and how this person's reacting. So great. All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh